Good evening. Welcome to Roosevelt House, the former home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. My name is Jessica Newworth, and I'm the Rita Hauser Director of the Human Rights Program here. We're honored this evening to be hosting the screening of 20 Days in Mariupol to commemorate World Press Freedom Day. I want to thank PEN America for bringing this film to us and AP for making the film. As you will see, it is a painful film to watch. It graphically documents the wanton death and destruction of a city and its people. Tragically, these atrocities continue in Ukraine, which makes this film all the more important. It brings home the reality of what Ukrainian people are suffering and highlights the urgency of ending this invasion and ensuring accountability for these war crimes. As we're nearing World Press Freedom Day, our world has made press freedom both more elusive and more necessary. Fake news has become, in some cases, a reality, while in other cases, a false accusation. We have journalists like Evan Gersovich in jail in Russia, and here in the US, we have courts adjudicating defamation on an unprecedented scale. It's a turbulent time for journalism, as well as for the world in general. In all of this, Mstislav Chernov is a godsend, a journalist with commitment, integrity, and tremendous courage. We thank him for making this extraordinary film and for being with us here tonight. Thanks to our other distinguished panelists who you will hear from following the screening, Julie Pace, Senior VP and Executive Editor of AP, and Sergei Tomilenko, President of the National Union of Journalists of Ukraine. And finally, it is a pleasure to introduce Suzanne Nossel, the CEO of PEN America, who will say a few words before the film now and then moderate the panel discussion immediately following. Suzanne, thank you again for your partnership in this event. Thank you so much, Jessica, uh, for hosting us here in this uh, beautiful and, and such a fitting space. We're really proud as PEN America to present this event. Our work at PEN America is an organization that both celebrates and defends freedom of expression worldwide, spans across the defense of journalism, of writing, and of art and creativity. And this film really brings all of that together in what you will see is, is such a powerful and unforgettable way. And it illustrates the ways in which those different media and enterprises overlap. They're all about using words and images to bear witness and to move people to action. And uh, it's hard to envision a synthesis uh, that is quite as potent as the one that you are about to see. And as Jessica said, they, they, th this movie is disturbing. We're here to bear witness. We wouldn't need to bear witness if there weren't troubling things to bear witness to. So that's the enterprise that we collectively are engaged in. And the work of journalists, the work of writers, the work of artists depends on all of us to be amplifiers, to send this message into the world, to take the ideas from a film like this and bring them into action. And all of that, all of this work, depends upon the fundamental rights and freedoms that are celebrated and reinforced this week at World Press Freedom Day. We're delighted to have the Director General of UNESCO here with us, uh, Audrey Azulay, Wake, welcome. Uh, as, as part of this event, and she's here to preside over a whole series of panels and discussions that are taking place over the next couple of days to uphold and amplify uh, this set of liberties that underwrites uh, the work that Misty and uh, that, that so many do at great risk and with tremendous courage. Uh, you have on your seats a postcard uh, on behalf of Evan Gershkovich. I think everybody in the audience uh, knows of his fate and his plight, and we ask you to please fill that out. We'll be collecting them. Uh, we're going to be translating them into Russian along with partners, and we'll be delivering them. And, and just finally, on behalf of PEN America, uh, doing this is especially meaningful because we have worked for years with our counterparts at PEN Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian branch of PEN, and it's an organization that my colleagues here have worked to build up and to support, and they've just been 
doing the most extraordinary work uh, for years, but particularly over the last year, traveling all over Ukraine to document, to bear witness, to distribute books and other things, generators, fuel, cars, uh, and in every way have activated the voices of writers in the literary community uh, at this time of extremists uh, and crisis in their country. And we're very proud tonight to stand with them. We have a program to support artists inside Ukraine. And uh, I encourage you, we'll talk more uh, at the end about how you can get involved. So with that, uh, 20 days in Mariupol. So uh, I know it's a lot to take in. Um, but we're really honored to have Mstislav Chernov, who is the, the man that you've just come to know over the last hour and a half. Uh, and that voice that I don't think any of us will forget. Uh, he, of course, is a journalist with the Associated Press. He's reported from Syria, Iraq, Libya, Belarus, and Afghanistan, has covered the conflict in Ukraine since 2014. He's president of the Ukrainian Association of Professional Photographers and a member, a member of Penn Ukraine. Julie Pace is the senior vice president and executive editor of the Associated Press. She leads AP's global news operations and oversees news content and journalists based in 250 locations in 100 countries. She's po covered US politics since 2008 and was the AP's first multimedia political journalist. She was named Chief White House Correspondent in 2013 and then AP's DC Bureau Chief in 2017. And then finally, Sergei Tomilenko, who is President of the National Union of Journalists of Ukraine since 2017. It's an independent NGO that works on press freedom and support for journalists and media workers. He has a background in journalism, was working as a journalist and editor since 1998, and is a member of the Steering Committee of the European Federation of Journalists. So uh, just an extraordinary group to talk about this uh, just heart-stopping film. So uh, Mr. Slav, I mean, just to begin uh, a year later, can you tell us a bit about how you're doing? You have this moment in the film where you say the brain wants to forget, but the camera remembers. And I, I, I'm sure uh, that memory must weigh so heavily and uh, would love to hear just a bit about how you, how you cope and how you move forward with that. Thank you for coming here today and thank you for not walking away, by the way. It's, um, I know it's not an easy thing to watch, but again, um, over and over, I see, and as um, anniversary of Mariupol uh, fall approaches in a few weeks, it seems like uh, a good reminder of not of what just happened in a year ago, but of what is happening now uh, in Bakhmut, in uh, Marinka, in uh, Avdivka, and all other small and big villages on the front lines and all of those uh, cities that has been destroyed or occupied or just destroyed. Uh, so Mariupol, uh, although the siege of Mariupol is over for its residents, uh, for me, uh, it's uh, a symbol of how exactly uh, Russia is uh, invading Ukraine, and how, what methods does it use, and what journalists are going through to keep covering this. Because what you've seen here is not an exclusive experience to me or to Evgeny Maloletka or Vasilisa Stepanenko, uh, those who were with me in Mariupol. Um, this is an experience of every single Ukrainian or international journalist is going through in Ukraine uh, right now. Yeah, you can say more on that later. Um, it, it, in 
didn't let me go. Mariupol didn't let us go. As soon as we left Mariupol, and we all thought, we, the whole team thought we left way too early. <laughs> Sorry. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, obviously you have that feeling from the film too. And then the day after that, Mariupol Drama Theater got bombed and around 500 people got killed, which we found out later through our um, thorough reconstruction of the events and uh, conversations with uh, witnesses. But we couldn't find any footage, well, there was like a bits and pieces, but that's exactly why it's so important to have journalists in the places where there are possible war crimes and human rights violations. That is, we almost know, don't know anything about 500 people dying in, a, in two minutes, airstrike of the uh, shelter, just to just a bomb shelter with children. And some of those women you've seen, the pregnant women that were bombed in a maternity hospital, those who didn't get injured, who were lucky enough not to get injured, some of them were sent to the drama theater shelter to be there, and they died there. So Mariupol doesn't let go, really. and. Um, it's an illusion that the camera is a, a shield that journalists have in front of their face to protect them from traumatic experiences. It's a constant reminder. You know, you see the images over, over, and over, and over again. But people who remain in Mariupol forever, people who lost their houses, people who lost their relatives, loved ones, their experiences are much more important because we made a choice to do what we do and they didn't. So I just want to say that however hard it is for journalists, for regular Ukrainians, it's even harder. Thank you. Oh, I hope I answered the question. You Sorry. Did. Thank you. Um, you know, th kind of throbbing through the film is this compulsion that you have to get the images out and you know you go to great lengths and risk to do that out of the sense that as Vladimir puts it you know this this may change the course of the war and I wonder you know for us having witnessed this policy debate about the international response very robust on many dimensions uh, but also limited uh, sharply limited Kind of how you how you think about that and how you thought about that at the time, at, you know, w relative to your expectations about what this would elicit. So my work my work with AP started in 2014, and uh, second story I did for AP a video story. A second video story I did for AP was when Russians shot down. Boeing MH17 over Ukraine. I was one of the first journalists who arrived there and sent it. It was all across the world, and I was very naive. And uh, it was like a beginning of the war. I didn't know anything about war journalism. Uh, and I thought, oh my God, I was in that field filming. The, the airplane was burning, and there were people scattered across the uh, field, and these children dead children tied up to seats. Uh, it was horrible. It was the worst thing I've ever seen. I looked at this and I was filming it. And most of that, by the way, wasn't even published because it's just impossible to see. Uh, I mean, it was sent, but it wasn't just, nobody else saw it. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, that's it. War is going to stop. You know, world is going to see that, and people are going to change their minds, and they're going to stop Russia because it was very clear who did it already. Then it was very clear. Well, the court is over now. Now we know officially, but back then it was clear. And I thought everything is going to stop. Well, look, it didn't. It got worse. So, um, maternity hospital happens. Rescue workers carry Irina pregnant woman across trouble, 
cars burning. I see this terrible scene and uh, my heart is just breaking and I think this is gonna, you know, if I will be able to even send it, then it's gonna like energize people to act. Uh, at the same time, I think, oh, well, I don't know if it's gonna change anything at all. Uh, it's what I hope, but uh, every single journalist probably, every single war journalist probably hopes to make a, a photo or a video that stops the war. That's a quote from uh, my good friend, Max Levin, who was killed point blank, shot by Russian troops in a forest near Kiev. Well, um, no, it's not possible to stop the war with a photo. That's people who see a video or a photo who stop the war, and much, much later. Julie, I want to turn back to this this question of day day twenty and how the decision was made to call it and. How, how, what that's like for someone who, you know, in your position where the safety uh, and, and life of your employees is on the line and yet what they're doing is so singular and that hope persists that, you know, maybe there will be the photo that can change the course of the war. So how, 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 do, how what is that give and take? Uh, take us in, inside that. Uh, thank you for having us and thank you for screening the film. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that was particularly unique about this situation is that there wasn't one specific decision point where we said, we're going to call this, you're going to come out, in part because of how limited our communications were with each other. Um, as you heard in the film, just the um, ability to file the video and the photos and, and the reporting was so limited um, there, it's not as though we were having, you know, long daily conversations. It's not as though Mstislav and his colleagues could call and say, "Let me run this plan by you and see what you think about this," uh, and that there was some sort of sign-off process. And and I, I think about this quite a bit. I think you know, the reason that not only did this incredible reporting happen, but it happened in, in a way that allowed the team to operate safely is because they were Ukrainian. I truly don't think that there's another team that could have both produced this journalism and done it safely. It was their local knowledge, it was their contacts, it was their language skills, and we as kind of the editors in New York had to really trust in them because we didn't have the ability to communicate with them regularly. We were doing quite a bit on this end to try to identify possible evacuation routes, to try to connect with the UN, with other governments that might be taking advantage of humanitarian corridors if they opened, um, and passing on that information as we got it. But the reality was, you know, I couldn't make him get into a car. I couldn't make him leave the city. You know, this had to be, um, you know, a bit of instinct. And I really think ultimately that's what it was. I think it was this team knowing that, um, you know, for as much as they wanted to stay, they also wanted to live and they also wanted to keep reporting this this story. Now, this is a fairly extraordinary set of circumstances. It's not how we operate um, on a daily basis and there's much more um, decision making, you know, including in, in Ukraine now. Um, but again, I think about that quite a bit, the fact that this, this team's local knowledge and understanding is really what allowed them to both do this journalism and do it safely. Everything went according to plan, of course. Exactly according plan, to plan. <laughs> plan Z. <laughs> you got out alive. Um, Sergey, uh, you bring other Ukrainian journalists into the picture and uh, tell us what the situation has been for Ukrainian journalists uh, trying to document this war uh, for local media uh, and and sort of take us inside that. I think that uh, for now every Ukrainian journalist uh, is a war journalist. We should be uh, such, and we should be brave. Many journalists are working on front line. Many Ukrainian journalists uh, are uh, producers for foreign media teams, and we try to, to, to cover this war and we try to fix uh, war crimes to explain uh, this situation. 
And uh, we as union, we try to support our colleagues, support uh, with safety equipment, especially we thanks uh, our international donors and especially UNESCO for uh, high level safety uh, equipment. And now we collected 300 uh, safety vests and uh, um, and we organize special uh, rental points for foreign journalists and for Ukrainian media because safety is uh, is uh, is our priority and uh, uh, we we should um, save lives of our colleagues. But um, on occasion of uh, this important event, I want to present some. Uh, as a unique uh, Ukrainian media experience, it's local media for frontline and the occupied territories. We as union try to support our colleagues uh, from local small newspapers and such print media as traditional media, but it's now only media which can be consumed on these territories. As you've seen, uh, Russians destroyed Ukrainian territories, Russia destroyed infrastructure, and you, or Ukrainians, can't uh, consume digital media, can't consume TV, radio, but they can consume print media, and they demand uh, information. I traveled to frontline city Orikhiv, it's uh, located uh, two kilometers to Russia occupied territories in the Parisian district. I traveled uh, in March and <coughs> I discussed with local residents about their needs. And they thanks for humanitarian aids, but they demand information. And now we support and first issue of local newspaper were published and delivered to this uh, local residents. I uh, want to present such uh, newspapers. No new day, Novy Day. It's biggest newspaper for Kherson. Kherson now shelling by Russians, but uh, it's uh, biggest uh, newspaper now delivered. And uh, it's it's not military newspaper. It's not military news. It's civil uh, news about how to survive, how to receive some support, some information. But the most unique newspaper for these days, it's newspaper for Bakhmut. It's published monthly, and it's issued. Uh, it was printed in 12 of April. It delivered by army by volunteers to local residents, and it's a newspaper which uh, maybe survives some lives of uh, Ukrainians. So uh, we, uh, for this moment, we um, support, uh, we, we, we look for some, some money, for some finance uh, support from different donors, but uh, 25 such local small newspaper for the occupied and frontline territories now are printing and uh, our Ukrainians receive this important information. So journalists are important. Yeah, Thank I just want to add on that, um, that uh, first thing I was asking when I was calling from this uh, crater from a shell, uh, I was calling to editors from the satellite phone. I had to like wait for 10 minutes to catch the connection of the set phone. First thing I was asking is, what are the news? What's going on? What's going on with Kiev, Kharkiv, and Odessa? And, and uh, because I knew, as soon as I got in the street, people are gonna see the press sign on the helmet, and they're gonna come to me and say, "What's the news? What is Kiev still hold, holding? Is Kharkiv taken?" Or all these questions. And when we got out of the hospital, and you know, you heard that with, in the film that people. Uh, the, basically, society within Mariupol collapsed very quickly. It was not clear why why this happened. Uh, and I think Mariupol is a phenomenal uh, uh, example of of uh, which gives us uh, an insight uh, on what happens to society when uh, people don't have access to information. A society, modern society, collapses. Modern society collapses without information and therefore without good journalism. 
we are social beings, we exchange information, our survival depends on that, especially during the war. So professional journalism is so important, is like the information is sometimes more important than food. And it's a good thing to hold in mind as journalism frequently, uh, even in democratic countries, the trust to journalism falls, like declines. I think it's important to keep in mind that, well, we actually know what happens to society when there is no information and no journalism. It just collapses. That's, that's it. So, yeah. Uh, and, and Ukrainian uh, journalists are doing an incredible job to sorry. make sure. And, and I want to add a uh, last um, a sentence about Mariupol. Um, when Russians uh, controlled or occupied Mariupol, they printed fake local newspaper, Priazovsky Rabochi, they printed it in Russia and delivered to Mariupol as, uh, as media, as local uh, media brand which, in which uh, they trusted that local journalists and journalism are, uh, support Russia occupation. It was delivered as not as Russian news, but as local news, and uh, it, but it was fake news about occupation. And it worked. We'll come to the audience in a few minutes. Um, just to say, you know, your point that it is, it's about journalists and journalism, but it's also about the information ecosystem. And when that becomes polluted, society falls apart. And, you know, we've seen a version of that in our own country, uh, you know, over the last six or seven years. Uh, not at this level, fortunately, not yet, but uh, we watched the signs of decay. Uh, I want to hear a little bit and for you to share with the audience about how you conceived this documentary. And was this sort of in your head in real time that maybe you would string all of this together into something larger? Did that come up later? Uh, you know, was it, was it your idea? How, you know, it's a, it's, I mean, it's the translation of journalism into art in a really unusual and extraordinary and powerful way. And I uh, would love to hear about the genesis of that. Uh, I have a strong belief that we, as we form our understanding of the world around by watching news and by consuming news information, we form our understanding of the of the past uh, uh, with films and books. So uh, as soon as we left Mariupol and we carried with us all the hard drives with all the materials, it was around 30 hours of, of video and at that time it was about 30 to 40 minutes on, only published uh, on AP and it was obvious that there is much more to to that story and again I felt that it wasn't closed and I wanted to do more uh, and also I understood how little context well it was, it was quite understandable how little context to people is given by 30 or one minute uh, news pieces even if they are uh, uh, produced by uh, a reliable um, news organizations it's just not enough context not enough and knowing how um, meanings can be manipulated by just not having enough information uh, it was very clear that uh, we needed to do something that will give people more context uh, to understand what really happened, like what's the scale of the destruction, what's the scale of uh, uh, suffering of, of the Mariupol people. And also, again, there was this idea of that this has to stay there somewhere in let's say history is a big big word, but okay, it's there somewhere for maybe a Russian society to have an access to whenever they need it, or for the whole world to do it, to, to have access to it. So fortunately for, for me, AP has a really productive uh, and uh, good relationship with the PBS frontline, 
And well, as soon as we left, um, we started speaking with the front line and uh, uh, this perspective which you've seen here was not the first choice. Uh, like it was not supposed to be uh, voiced by me, but ultimately it just happens to be the best way to connect all the stories and to just like help the audience to understand enough context. Yeah, yeah it was just natural. I'm gonna ask one more question, then we're gonna turn to the audience, so please um, be ready uh, to raise your hand in a moment. I'm curious whether there was anything in the film that, you know, how, how, you, how you divide the, the boundary of what was too horrific to include. Were there things that were just so awful that you left them on the cutting room floor? Were you, there things that we did see that you debated uh, and weren't sure belonged in a, a, a film that uh, had, is going to be no seen by... We no debates over this at all, right? No debates. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, how, should... yeah, how did that get ad adjudicated? Well, I, one thing you should all know about Mstislav, if you haven't already um, gathered this, is he's extremely passionate about his work, and he um, fought for every <laughs> element of that film. And there was quite a bit, as he said, when he came out of Mariupol, um, had a tremendous amount of material, but I think that one of the things that you know, I think we wanted to make sure that the film got across was the horror of the situation. And if you're going to try to take people into this place and into this moment, you know, you can't whitewash it. You can't hold it, hold it back. Uh, luckily, luckily, and though these debates were really happening, uh, as even I was in Mariupol and still could speak to, <laughs> I remember sending this this uh, story like split in ten pieces, ten seconds, and the only email they would follow there would be names of people who we see and maybe some translations, but even not that. The email would follow. Please don't, please publish everything. And it will, everything was published. And this is a, a luxury of working for AP that we don't really hold back. We uh, just give warning to editors uh, or international editors who are subscribers that there is this footage and then the channels, the media uh, are making their own decisions. But we don't, we, we don't have to hold back. That's great. I, I, th I think it's great. Also, I've noticed and actually the whole media in all media in the world have slightly changed this year. The, the, the limits went higher. Like, we, we now show more. And I think part of that is because of misinformation. I think this is how it all ties together. And, and, and I remember very specifically the day after uh, we published Mstislav and Zhenya's images from the maternity ward, the Russian misinformation yeah. started, and I remember getting the next tranche of information from them and reading this 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 line of, of information, and we found out the woman had died. And one of the hardest things, knowing the situation that they were in, was having to say, can they go back and prove it? No, Not because I didn't believe them, but knowing how the misinformation was going to spiral and saying, can they go back and prove it? And of course, they did. But that idea that we had, to, we had to publish so much, that we had to publish so much information, we had to show our work, uh, even in these just extremely difficult conditions, it made it so that you know, there, was a, there was an impetus to publish more. Also, uh, a lot, like a lot uh, of the very, very hard images didn't make it to the film because uh, well, it's just because it would be too much. It would just push the audience away, numb, numb people. And that's, again, not what was intended. We, I intended to bring the audience, bring all of you to how, how is it to be there um, and how terrible it is. But at the same time, I wouldn't. Did you to. just have an instinct about where to draw that no, line? No, no, that, that line is, is a very hard learned line. We would. Uh, it was like hours and hours of discussions. It's just every frame is considered. Also, even even how much of a crop of a certain image, like 
few millimeters on the screen makes a lot of difference, really. Like, Can you give us an example in, of something we saw yeah, where like, you had to make those very fine distinctions? Yeah, I'll give an example. There is a, a, a moment when Evangelina dies uh, and um, the first child we see dying in a film, and actually the first child that has died in Mariupol. And there is a scene when the doctor closes her eyes. So here is the here is the here is the paradox, or here is the like a moral com complex question: How do you uh, not sanitize the images, uh, but at the same time, uh, how, how you also have to respect the victims? You also so all all that. Uh, whether you, as an audience, and with, with, with you see the eyes of the of the girl or not when they are being closed by a hand of a doctor, uh, also is a decision that has to be made in a, in a, in an editing room. Uh, so, again, this is not an, an easy decision. You have to spend hours and hours and hours looking at this image, but then you have to consider what what effect it has on the audience. And we, d we didn't see that exact no, moment, No, no, right? that is, the, that is yeah, the conscious choice. There yeah. is, uh, we see her face in the shot that was made, we see yeah. her face, we see a hand of a doctor closing her eyes. And um, yeah, but we chose not to go that far. And there are many other moments like this. Yeah, that's, a, that's very powerful. Uh, we can have time for a few questions here on the second row. You, you want me to wait for a mic? Uh, yes, it's coming right around. Thank you so much. Um, I was intrigued by the idea that you mentioned that if you had an opportunity to stay or an opportunity to go back, that you would. Do you have an idea of how many more would you want to have filmed it to the point where the Russians uh, seized the city? Or how, how long do you think is the amount of footage, that, uh, amount of areas that you need to cover that would really have fulfilled uh, maybe a, your more comprehensive idea? Uh, this is a question, yeah, which is hard to answer. It seems to be an easy question, but it's very hard because you, you don't, unless, again, good, I'm lucky, I have editors who tell me, hey, Mr. Slav, wake up. Uh, what's the plan to leave? Every single day is a question. So what's your plan today? You know, how are you leaving? What, what is the safe situation? So uh, one of the plans was to stay in Azovstal, actually. This is one of the like backup, way, way backup plans. We already knew that if the city gets run over, uh, and it seemed inevitable at that point, uh, Azovstal would be our last resort. Uh, but uh, it wasn't this in the beginning before we drove to Mariupol. We realized that on 23rd, we realized that, well, location-wise, it is very likely that it's going to be surrounded. We don't know if it's going to be taken, but it's probably going to be under the siege for an extensive period of time. But as all cities, as all sieges are, have, it will have green corridors for civilians. That's for sure. So there was one plan. A second plan was just stand, staying until the city is completely taken and blending with the crowd and quietly leaving afterwards, either with the doctors who are our friends or with you know, other, um, other civilians. Uh, that didn't seem to work for a reason that we suddenly became very personally targeted. Like suddenly, uh, and that's what we didn't expect, that Mr. Slav Chernov and Evgeny Maloletka are going to be claimed by Russians as information terrorists. We thought there's going to be a war press there and we're going to just blend in. So, yeah, that's, that's something that was not according to plan. And that was one of our biggest fears back here, yeah. was the idea that they might have to disavow their reporting, that they may have to claim that this had all been fake and that we would have no ability to be in touch with them at that moment. Uh, in the back, right in the back. Uh, no, sitting down. Uh, yeah. Let's go here and then we'll go to the uh, uh, woman in the pink jacket. Hello, um, at some point uh, in the film, uh, somebody asked you where you were from and you said Kharkiv. And uh, you mentioned your daughters and your family. 
Is your family safe? They're safe, yeah. They're refugees. Yevgeny's family is refugees too. Um, so and Vasilisa is from Kharkiv and she has uh, her house is destroyed and her family is refugees too. So two quick questions. One is what happened to your policeman friend who left with you? And the second question is these local newspapers remind me of the little newspapers that were printed by the French resistance. Um, is there a way, is there a conduit for funding? You said you were funded by UNESCO, but for example, could people in this room, you know, give you money? So those are my two, those are my you two questions. You should say yes That's to that. Question. <laughs> That's an excellent question. It's, it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and you responsible for this idea too. <laughs> Uh, um, for this moment, uh, we thank UNESCO for a uh, new project uh, which uh, devoted for training, for special, um, maybe training support of these uh, editors from local uh, uh, small newspapers. And we organize in big uh, training in Kiev, and we now um, have some mentors for them. But about financing, uh, we uh, are looking for some donors, and uh, uh, half of uh, such newspapers papers now financed by Switzerland government and uh, half financed by uh, US uh, embassy in Kiev. But uh, now really Russia and war, this war ruined the uh, media market in Ukraine and uh, um, we are all the Ukrainian media now struggles from economical crisis and we are looking for some money for resource to do this job, and uh, there are no advertisement, there are no um, postal subscription. So it's uh, now it's only can be free press for uh, citizens, but uh, it's our mission to inform and to to deliver this news. Yeah, well, you, you can ask us again later. We will give you more specific information. Who needs help? Because we we know who needs help there. Uh, so Vladimir is okay. He's back on the front lines and his family is evacuated to, well, they're safe. Um, yeah, he's back at the front line. I just want to say that we have found almost all the people you see in the film, almost all the parents, and um, we followed up with all the stories all we could, of course, not all of them, but those soldiers who evacuated us from the hospital, uh, some of them, um, well, those who whose faces you could recognize, they were uh, in prison, Russian prison, they were taken. Um, they retreated to us of Stalin, they were taken. Uh, but um, yeah, w it was important for us also to just wait a little bit with the film until they get released and those who, whose faces you see there, they are released and they're okay. Um, and uh, those families who lost children are broken, of course, and heartbroken and their lives are broken. And I'll just give you an example of one family uh, who uh, you saw um, a woman who is in the corridor of a hospital telling that they lost two children. She and her brother have lost, um, she had two children and her brother had two and they both lost a child. So after uh, the hospital was occupied by Russians uh, shortly after, um, they went to bury their children in the yard of their house uh, because the bodies of the children were in the hospital. So just breathe in for a second and think about how is it to dig a hole in the ground in winter. It's a very long time to dig a hole in winter in the ground uh, to bury your children there. And then they left because they had two, two other children to save, right? And so they left through the green corridor. And when Mariupol was taken, they came back uh, uh, to occupied Mariupol. They came back and 
they wanted to rebury their children and they didn't find the bodies. It was, uh, they were taken away by Russians to just like get rid of everything. However, they were uh, able to find uh, these bodies uh, among hundreds of other bodies in nearby the hospital. There's like a building of a, uh, which is part of a co hospital compound. Among the hundreds of other bodies, they've been able to find bodies of their children. And they had to bury them again in a, a cemetery outside of uh, Mariupol. And those numbers, those numbers you saw in the end of the film on the graves, uh, on the cemetery, these are not numbers of bodies. These are just locations. Under each number, there is five at least people or parts. And also those people who have died in the buildings that has been knocked down or being knocked down. They haven't been buried. They just knocked, being knocked down but together with buildings, crushed, crushed, and used to build roads by Russians, okay? So just breathe it in. Sorry, I know it's all heavy to hear, but since we're here to discuss this stuff, we just might. But yeah, we followed up. We're trying to get, uh, make sure that all the families get the help they need. Uh, here in the hat. Um, before I ask my question, I wanted to say, on behalf of, I think, a few people here, I wanted to say thank you to the three of you, and especially to you for making the film. Um, I can't imagine, after what we've seen, what the kind of fortitude you must have in order to do it. So I just wanted to give you a round of applause for that. Thank you. Of course, it's the least we can do. But the, the, my question is simple. Is the distribution of the film or the visibility of the film, um, what are the plans and where can we, because you know, I have like 50 friends that I want them to see it now and and uh, who want to see something like this so <laughs> it's his film i want him to say uh so the film will be um uh have a theatrical re release in new york uh in july um and then in california after that and then with our partners at um frontline pbs will air likely later this fall and film it's gonna be at film forum i think in mid, mid july july 12th fantastic thank you so and thank you again I think uh, one more in the back. Uh, what's that? Oh. Oh, this one has a question. What, what is the current situation in Maripol today, and how is the reporting being done from that particular location, and are you involved in trying to get back there or not? Uh, could you repeat the end of the question? Sorry. And are, and are you involved in wa situation. wanting to try to want to get back there to do what's currently happening or what has happened since you've been there? Uh, we are trying to keep up with what's happening there. So, first of all, uh, obviously not enough is being done there. Uh, hundreds of houses getting knocked down, like high rises getting knocked down, and few houses are being built. And those houses who are which are built, uh, Russians are mostly uh, um, bringing in workers or, or um, Russian. Um, uh, nationality people just to kind of b blend in in the population. So that is actually a tactics that have been used by Soviet Union that uh, uh, blend in populations, bring some of the local population away from the city and bring some of the population from like far, far east uh, to the city. So there is like a less protest potential um, but Russians are trying to make an example of the city. It's very important for them to show that, okay, well, look at Mariupol, everything is going to be fine with all the cities we've destroyed, so it's okay. That's what they're trying to show. But they're not doing enough, obviously, and it's only a fraction of, of people who live there 
uh, are back, and those who are back, they have their own reasons. Uh, there is a pretty, like, some conflict within people who think, within Mariupol residents who can never go back because of the moral reasons, uh, and those who decided to stay and just to carry on. So there is this internal conflict within within this uh, population, which I think is a whole way, a whole another tragedy which Ukraine has to live through. Because when Mariupol gets liberated, you know, people are gonna come back and then they're gonna face each other. You stayed, I left. You worked with Russians, I didn't. So on and so forth. That introduces all another level of mm -hmm. internal conflict later on. Uh, yeah, but uh, well, the cities were destroyed, and, um, and they will rebuild something, but never to the extent that it was. It will be more like a just a, enough to show on camera that it's that something is done. I really hope I can come back someday, you know, as it's liberated. Thank you. Just in closing, you know, that scene where uh, th there's the baby being born and the doctors are shaking and slapping and uh, just this superhuman will that, that seems to bring the baby to life, the power of that. And I think the, the power of this film to jolt all of us and uh, awaken something within us. I think we've all felt here in this room, and I think we're gonna feel it around the world as, as this movie moves forward. So we're so honored to just be part of the, the very beginning of this and to have the three of you here to reflect uh, on, on these events. And uh, I just really want to give you a huge round of applause. Just, sorry, just not much, not much. It's still a, uh, I just want to remind that this is, the reason why we're here is a huge tragedy. I really, really appreciate the support and that we are here. I really appreciate that. But it's such a tragedy. I'm sorry, I'm getting so emotional every time I um, have to speak about this. And uh, yeah, I hope this will never repeat again, but it is repeating again and again and again. So we'll go there and we'll keep reporting.